Freedom Valley Church, hope for those who have given up on church. This program was brought to you by you, the friends and partners of Freedom Valley Church. Thank you for partnering with us and thank you for watching today. I'd love to hear from you at any time during this program. You can write me at the email address g, just the letter g, at freedomvalley.org. Uh, g at freedomvalley.org would get an email to me, and I'd love to hear whatever is on your heart or how God is using this in your life. If you'd like to write us via regular mail, write Freedom Valley Church, 3185 York Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 17325. And I want to encourage you to stay with me today and throughout this series. This is a uh, passionate thing that God has given my heart to share with you uh, called grit. It is about how to persevere in life and to love your life even through the most difficult times that you got to pass through. This will help you in your emotional intelligence, in your IQ, in your understanding of how God works in your life to make you smarter than you were born through the principles that transform how you look at life. I hope you enjoy this and I hope you stay with me. I really felt like I ruined my life beyond repair. I was just, I was lost. One day I was woken by my, my dad and he said that my mom was in a horrible car accident. She said she was in critical condition in the hospital. All I remember after the car accident was um, children and youth stepping in and taking me and my brother out of the home and placing us in foster care. Um, that was probably the most devastating thing that I'd say probably happened in my life. I didn't understand why I was taken from my mom um, and placed in what I thought was a punishment. Um, I felt like I was being punished for what somebody else did. When I was 16 years old, I committed a crime. Um, I got arrested for it when I was 17 and they charged me as an adult and sent me to Camp Hill State Prison where I turned 18. I got, I got out of prison when I was 21. Um, I still had a piece of me missing. Um, everything was good for a while and then like this, this emptiness inside me just drove me to drugs again. I started dabbling with harder drugs this time I ended up getting caught with a whole bunch of drugs and um, ended up doing a lot of time for that uh, four year period all together. When I got out of jail, there's still something missing. I don't know what it was, moving from one place to another, being over here in this city, moving over here, looking for something that was, you know, just not there. I didn't have anywhere to go where I was. I was living in Cumberland, Maryland. And um, I decided, you know, that I would just get a tent and go stay in the woods and try to find a job. I woke up one day um, by the state police of Maryland telling me to get out of my tent and I couldn't camp there because it was private property. They threw me out of my homelessness to go be homeless somewhere else. So like, you know, that like really hit, hit me and I'm just like, you know, I'm like, I was, I was, I was really hurt and broken like, just being out there in the streets and stuff. And I got on my bike and I'm riding around looking for another place to basically camp. And I came up over this hill and there was a, a big Assemblies of God church. And um, so I go in and I talk. <laughs> I talk to the pastor and I'm, I asked him, what time is your service on Sunday? And he said, he looked at me, you know, like this. And he's like, do you need to talk? And I'm like, yeah. And um. He, uh, he, he took me in the office and he sat me down and the first question he asked me is where do I live? And at that moment I just, I lost it. I was just like, you know, I'm homeless, I'm living in the woods. And, and he, he just, he, he called a couple people and they came and they prayed with me and they were like, you know, it's gonna be okay and we're gonna work through this. And um, he introduced me to a couple people in the church and, um, you know, and I just kept, you know, seeking the Lord and going to the Bible studies and, um, you know, seeing what, you know, my purpose really was. And, and 
whenever I found out, you know, that, that God really does love us, it, it, it was just, it was like that hole in me was filled that I chased my whole entire life. I was reading in the Bible where um, it says in Romans 13 that we should submit to our governing authority. And um, in my heart, I knew that I had warrants out for my arrest. And um, I decided the thing to do was to go to the police station and turn myself in. One of the warrants that I had was from Adams County from a long time ago. And um, so when I got here, um, I did a little bit of time in the county jail. And as I was in the county, I was reading the word um, going to like all the Bible studies and like really seeking God and trying to figure out you know, what, what his direction for my life was. And I came across this pamphlet for the, uh, the Freedom House. I, I thought being as though I was you know, just starting my walk with the Lord and stuff, I thought it would be a really good idea to not go right back to the streets and instead to go to a Christian discipleship program. My life now is, is uh, peaceful, um, I have joy. I don't have like anxiety knowing like, is tomorrow gonna be my last day on the street? Is, you know, is everything I'm doing in my life right now useless because the enemy's just gonna steal it all away anyway? Like I don't have that fear today. There's a scripture in Colossians, uh, I think it's 122. It says that um, for those who are in Christ, um, we're brought into His presence and we stand holy and blameless before Him without a single fault. And to me, that is the message of the cross. It's like when we believe in Jesus, our sins aren't there anymore. We become a new creature. Welcome back to our GRIT series. This is the fourth installment of the series, and I'm excited to share with you uh, GRIT Believes in Miracles. The whole GRIT series was inspired by Angela Duckworth and the University of Penn in a TED Talk that I saw months back when she said that we think the real determiner of a student's success could be GRIT, not IQ necessarily, not other relational skills or uh, learned skills along the way, but the learned skill of grit, meaning perseverance over time. Somebody who has uh, continued to persevere toward a goal over time. Some amazing studies have been done on this so far that is gradually, it would feel to me, transforming some parts of education and culture for us today in some powerful and surprising ways. I love it so much. And I want to share with you the edge that people of faith have in the area of grit from the Word of God. The Bible gives us an edge by documenting for us uh, hundreds and even thousands of years of people who have been gritty under enormously difficult circumstances because they knew something, they understood something, they worked through where most people would or even should have given up. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles, if you've got a, a smart device handy or, or, a, or a Bible handy, go to Mark chapter 2. Maybe you want to try uversion.com or biblegateway.com, whichever is handier for you, or a host of other great uh, Bible sites. I mostly use uversion.com from the New Living Translation. And I want to read that with you in just a little bit. I got a piece of humor I have liked this week. Anna Crago handed me this joke after church last week. She said a tough old cowboy from South Texas counseled his granddaughter that if she wanted to live a long life, the secret was to sprinkle a pinch of gunpowder on her breakfast every morning. The granddaughter did this religiously to the age of 103 when she finally died. She left behind 14 children, 30 grandchildren, 25 great-grandchildren, and a 15-foot hole where the crematorium used to be. <laughs> I love that. That was great. That was a gritty old cowboy, I believe. Mark chapter 2 has an incredible story recorded from the life of Jesus and from Jesus' amazement at how people conducted themselves 
in surprisingly powerful ways. I want you to watch this and how the heart of God was moved by the action of four incredibly faith-filled guys. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't, believe, they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. Some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question in your hearts? Is, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Now, Grit 4, I want to talk about how gritty people believe in miracles and how, how the miraculous works, because we're not in charge of miracles. Miracles are outside of our control, right? Yet many miracles in the Word of God were provoked by the actions of a human being. So maybe there is a role that you can play in this miraculous life, in this gritty experience that causes you to persevere where other people fail and to win in those circumstances. I want to point out what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us through Mark chapter 2 to the best of my ability and spend some time building that in myself and in you as I declare the Word of God. First thing I notice is, is in verse 4, they couldn't bring him in to Jesus because of the crowd, so... And I want you to think a little bit about what you would do after the comma. Follow the story for a minute, and we'll work up to that. So let's go back a couple of paces. These four guys get up. Let's say it's a Wednesday morning or whatever. They wake up on a Wednesday morning and they say, We heard Jesus, this new Bible teacher, is uh, going around teaching the Word of God, and astounding things are happening. Demons are coming out of people. Things that could not be healed or counseled away are suddenly gone in an instant. Something's different with this guy. And so we ought to figure out what to do with our friend who's paralyzed. Now, these guys must have believed that they had a role in the miracles of God somehow. It took planning. It took coordination for them to get to this point. It took enormous amounts of work. Sometimes we only want to use faith in ways that doesn't mean any work for us, but these guys were not afraid of work. So they, they pulled together a plan. I want you to notice the plan was not simple. If you've ever tried carrying a person for any distance, it's never simple carrying a human being so four people are carrying a mat. I don't know what that mat was like, but I'm guessing it was probably some handmade thing. And they figured out a way. They, they coordinated a way between the four of them to carry this guy down the street. It's one thing to get started, another thing to keep doing. And I don't know how far they went, but clearly a distance. When they finally get to the house, they couldn't get him to Jesus. Now, if you've been with me through this series, I said that one of the ideas that I want to attack, one of the cultural ideas that seems to be gaining foothold, at least in the little world I live in, is the if it was meant to be, it'll be idea. Some of us have started this spiritual sounding quotation when we look at life to just say, I can't help it. If it was meant to be, it'll be. I wanted to buy a house, but... 
it didn't work out and so if it was meant to be it'll be and i i wanted to have a good marriage but i things got difficult and if it was meant to be i guess it'll be i wanted to be a healthy person but things developed along the way and if it was meant to be i guess it'll just be notice that people of faith who believe in miracles don't look at life like that so these guys get to the house they finally have carried this man for some distance i i could imagine blocks or miles and they finally get to the house where jesus was they thought if they could just get him in front of jesus some amazing things were happening with terminally ill people who got in front of jesus so let's just get him there right so they get him down the street they finally get to the house and the house is packed somebody looks over their shoulder and says what do you guys think you're doing here you're not getting him in this door there is no way people are standing shoulder to shoulder packed like a new york subway train at five o'clock there's no way you're getting on this train i was reminded of uh, of one uh, big city train I'm thinking the story I heard was from Japan where they have pushers that have these big paddles that push people onto the train so the doors can shut. They literally have officials at their train stops that push people onto the door so the door can shut. Uh, it was like that. This house was packed. There was no way. You're getting four more people carrying a fifth person on a mat. It's not going to happen. Give it up. So it says they couldn't bring him into Jesus because of the crowd. So what do you do after that comma? I was planning to get healthy, but after that diagnosis, I, um, I, I was planning to make a difference in the world, but you don't understand with, the background I was handed, I, 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 Gritty people have learned something about the impossible that changes them. Gritty people love the stories of impossible things that became possible. They love that Abraham Lincoln, while he failed at several businesses, became the president that changed the world. They love that uh, America again and again is made up of people who are from the wrong race, the wrong side of the tracks, the wrong situation become something they should never become. They love them the stories of impossible situations where a house was too full to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. And so, they figure out another way. Gritty people smile at the impossible. They will not be stopped. They refuse to be refused. They deny to be denied. They cannot take into their soul that they're not going to get in the house. And they smile at the impossible because secretly inside, they're already planning another way. I want you to notice in verse 4, So they dug a hole through the roof above his head, and then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. So many things going on in this when I read this story. I'm imagining trying to preach while somebody's digging a hole in the roof above my head. How did Jesus persevere through this situation on his side? Didn't he at, at, at one point say, hey, you disciples over here, I need somebody outside to find out what's going on up in that roof. I'm trying to preach here and somebody's trying to dig through the house. I can't imagine that service. I've never seen a roof that isn't incredibly dirty to be torn apart. And I can imagine the filth raining down on Jesus and on that crowd inside. And yet he's trying to get through that thing somehow. I've discovered in life, God does some amazing things in the midst of some of the most distracting circumstances. If you haven't learned young how to tune into the voice of God, regardless of anything, you'll often miss him. 
these guys, when they came up to the house where they were not able to get in the house, they simply made a new plan. Their first plan failed, so they replanned. Greedy people are ready to replan if the first plan fails. Now, they had worked hard on the first plan. They had coordinated it. They had worked it. Then they had replanned it. Things had not gone easy for them. And nowhere along here were the, is it saying, well, they shrugged their shoulders and said, I guess our friend was just meant to be paralyzed. They just simply built a new plan. There wasn't a way to get into Jesus, so they created a way. They replanned what failed until they got there. You know, anybody who achieves anything worthwhile in life is somebody who says, if the first plan fails, there's got to be another plan. If the second plan fails, there's got to be another plan. I was watching with great interest a researcher that was working on marriages that become the kind of love stories that we all look at and say, wow, I wish I had a relationship like that. And he said, in our research of great marriages, couples that have an unusual connection and an unusual love and an unusual synergy between the two of them are almost always couples that went through a period where they thought our relationship isn't going to make it. So he, he said, here's what, we, what surprised us. We thought couples that made it were people who always had everything going for them and never allowed anything else. But we discovered the opposite. Couples who made it and had great love relationships are almost always people who faced the possibility of failure and had to replan their plan for how to stay in love. That's why I think in Revelation, I have come to treasure this little phrase in Revelation where Jesus says to the one church, it's more than a phrase, it's a couple of phrases, where he says to the one church, you've lost your first love. I've talked to a lot of couples who said, we've lost our first love. Something happened. A relationship snuck in. A, uh, we, we got distracted. Something destroyed our ability to love each other for a while. And then one of us, in many cases, started to make a new plan. How could I win her back again? How could I try this whole thing over? And, and he says to that church, he said, you lost your first love. You know what you got to do to get back your first love? Remember what it used to be like, because those memories draw you back into it. Go back and do the things you did at first, because anybody can fall in love with somebody who's putting on their best like you did at first. Remember that first date where you planned what you would say and how you would say it, and you, and you uh, even planned your poses and how you're going to uh, talk to each other, and, and you, you dressed your very best, and you were doing your best, presenting your best, uh, projecting your best. Anybody can fall in love with that. So he said, go back and do the plan again. These guys, when they couldn't get to Jesus, they just built a new plan. And the new plan was ridiculous. We're going to get up on this house, dig through the roof, and lower him down through the roof to Jesus. Because if we can get him to Jesus, we can get him saved. We can get him healed. We can get his health saved. we got to get him to Jesus. We're going to do that no matter what. So the plan fails. They just build a new one again. They coordinated carrying him up to that roof and setting him down. Can you imagine him on that mat saying, guys, give it up. I was just meant to be like this. Why, are you, why do you keep trying? Just face it. Jesus doesn't have time for me. Jesus isn't going to, he's not going to touch me. He, he, this is not going to make a difference. But these four guys could not be stopped. They had this indomitable belief that if they got him to Jesus, Jesus would do the rest. You know, I, I watch this again and again in church. I love when church people have this attitude toward their friends. If I could just get my friends into the presence of God and where the family of God meets around his living room, he'll do the work. He'll change them. You know, it's the absolute truth. Indomitable belief often gets it done. And uh, friends, those, these kind of friends cast around for an idea. My friend is paralyzed spiritually. I got to get him help. Or my friend is paralyzed physically. I got to get him help. And if the first thing doesn't work, I'm going to try another thing. If the other thing doesn't work, I'm going to try more. Can you imagine people around there saying, what are you doing digging through the roof? That is wrong. You cannot dig through somebody's roof. We have to. We got to get this man healed. You cannot disrupt that meeting with dirt falling down on Jesus' head while you're trying to get in to heal somebody. That's ridiculous. You don't understand. We have got to get our friend healed. They would not be denied in their plan. So they just built a new plan when the first one failed. 
I, when, I, when I read this, I want to ask myself, am I the kind of person that if the first thing I try fails, am I still planning? Or am I just concluding, well, that wasn't meant to be? Obviously, it got hard, so I, God must not want that for me. The will of God for my life. See, some of us have the attitude that the, the will of God for our lives would make things easier. I remember a discussion years ago with a, with a person who, for the first time, found themselves on the inside of church leadership at Freedom Valley. They had never been on the inside of church leadership before. And they said, if God was really doing what is being done at Freedom Valley, should it be so hard? And I thought, you're right. Shouldn't it all just fall together? Isn't that, isn't that how we know it's God? And then all of a sudden, Bible story after Bible story after Bible story started flooding back at me. Moses was supposed to go get the children of Israel out of Egypt. He goes down and says, Pharaoh, I came for my people. Pharaoh says, no. Moses says, well, that's not an acceptable answer. Ten times he goes back. No. No, you're not getting them. God made it happen because Moses refused to give up. And then again and again through history, God worked through and in spite of people who refused to give in to the impossible, continued to plan. Uh, look at verse 5. It says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. God was moved. Jesus is God. And Jesus noticed their faith. We sometimes want God to notice misery. And I believe there's Bible evidence that God notices misery. But he is moved by faith, not by misery. I've been in intense pain and felt like God didn't notice. You know what he does notice? Faith. And faith, when it becomes a real deep-seated belief, becomes visible. If I'm standing in the middle of the highway and there's a an 80,000 pound truck barreling toward me. The belief that that truck will not be able to stop or avoid me causes me to move like crazy off the road. My belief becomes visible in action. The same thing is true with faith in what we believe for a friend in this case. If you believe it, it becomes a visible thing. Real faith is visible. So let me ask you, is your faith visible? Of somebody who says, I believe in God, but, but doesn't prove it with 10% their, with of their income in the tithe. Jesus said, this is how you manage your heart. Get your tithe done. Because what it does is it makes faith visible. Not that God needs your money or church needs your money. It's that you need faith to become visible. So faith requires an action. To believe in healing is to instruct your body to be healed to declare it because those words make faith visible. The declaration starts the process of visibility. God notices visible faith. Let me ask you today, if you're a gritty person, is your faith visible? If you're becoming gritty, your faith must become visible. Thank you for watching today. Our grit series was specifically designed by God to help you persevere to win and to love life throughout the challenges that God has given you to face. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you want to write me, my email address is g, just the letter g, at freedomvalley.org. Very simple. And Freedom Valley would benefit from hearing from you. If you want to write us at regular mails, 3185 York Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 17325. Thank you so much for being with us, for watching this today. If you don't have a church that you're a part of, we want to invite you to visit and be part of Freedom Valley Church. Uh, every Saturday night, we have a full meal together. You could be involved. It's free at uh, about 5.15. Sunday mornings at 9.15 and 11.15. Our services are designed to help you connect with God. I believe you will if you take the time to join us.